So then in summary, we last time we derived the uh, implicit or the pressure equation. Now, we didn't talk about wells yet, but you handle wells, you know, which turn up in the productivity <coughs> in index. You handle them very similar uh, to the way you do in single phase flow. You just do it on a component by a component basis. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about it, but for right now we haven't. So you can almost, you know, in this case you can ignore the J uh, for now, like we don't have any wells. But then, uh, so you have the so-called pressure equation, which is derived from the overall mass balance, and the so-called saturation equation, which is derived from one of the two component balances, usually the water. Okay, and then the idea is that you solve the pressure equation first, so then you have the full pressure field. You plug that pressure field into the saturation equation along with the old saturation and you update the saturations. And then you take another step in time and you do it again. Okay? Now, if you do that, you know, this is only this is only a partially implicit system, right? We're taking we have imp fully implicit for pressures but explicit for saturations, so there is a there is a time step criterion associated with that. You do have to take relatively small time steps when you do that. And you can't get errors that propagate. So sort of the next the next best thing you can do is you can actually implement an iterative procedure at every time step. Right? So n the normal MPES process, you would solve the pressures, update the saturations, and take another step in time. But what you could do if you want a really accurate solution is Solve the pressures, update the saturations, <coughs> but before you take another step in time, take those saturations, put them back into the pressure equation, solve for the pressures again, update the saturations, and continue to do that in a loop, right, until you have some converged criterion. Usually the criterion would be that the, the error change from one iteration to the next of the saturations is less than some amount, right, one e to the minus sixth or something some tolerance. So that'll give you a more accurate solution. The, you know, the most accurate thing you can do is to take a fully implicit scheme, but that's very computationally expensive. Well, you, so the, in the pressure equation, there's saturations in the relative permeabilities, right? No, it's, it's in the... Because they're in the T matrix, right? The T matrix is the total transmissibility. It has oil and water in them, and each of those have relative permeabilities in them, right? So when you get the new when you get the new saturations, you plug them back in over here, solve the pressure equation again, take the pressures, put them back over there, and you just keep doing it until you converge to some value. Then once you converge to some value, you take another step in time, and you do it all over again. So. That, that 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 scheme itself can be kind of computationally <laughs> expensive because you're you're iterating and and I would you know I would dare say that it's probably less expensive to just do a fully implicit solve in that case as opposed to this iterative procedure. But in uh, I you know uh, in CMG I think you have that ability. In all your commercial simulators you'll have this ability to, to iterate on the saturations if you want. Okay, so then uh, something I want to spend the next few minutes talking about is this upwinding, okay? Uh, and try to describe a little bit about what that is. So I'll write down the overall mass balance one last time. <coughs> 
So let's look at this term right here. So if I, if I assume that the permeability and the viscosity and the formation volume factor are constant, I can pull them outside that differential. But the relative permeability is a function of space, which is a field variable. I mean, that's what we're solving for. It's going to be different spatially, right? So I can't take it outside the derivative. So just using the product rule, that term expands to something like that. I could do the same thing for the oil term there in the first. And, and then if I just expanded everything out and group terms, I'd have I didn't up with some equation that looks roughly like this. <coughs> right? Where A, B, and C are some constants that are functions of the relative permeabilities of viscosity bonds. So I'd end up with some equation like this, and for the purposes of now, that it's, it's adequate to just say that A, B, and C are constant, and we have this equation. So mathematically, does anyone know what that equation is from? Like if you were taking a course of differential equations and somebody wrote down that equation, does it have a name for it? What about if V is zero? So if I cover up V. We've seen that equation around. It's the heat equation, or the pressure diffusivity equation, or the diffusion equation, right? Okay. What about cover up C? Does anybody know what that thing's called? C is zero. Starts with a A, maybe, or a C. Convection, advection, advection, convection. Convection, right? <laughs> advection. It's, it's, they're very similar. So sometimes it's called the advection equation or convection equation. And so, I guess, does it, do, you, do you know what the difference between advection and diffusion is physically? So, you, you mentioned the heat equation. I think it's probably easier understood in, the concept, in terms of heat, right? So, imagine I'm standing here with a giant torch, like, like an Olympic torch, right? And I light it, and it's kind of cold in the room, and I just stand here. It's going to warm the room up, right? The process of that, warming the room up, with me just standing here, and you feeling the heat, is diffusion, okay? As opposed to if I were to grab the torch and light it and run towards you, right? Now you're going to feel the heat because I'm moving it towards you. And more specifically, you could think of me being like a velocity, like if there, there was a wind in the room, right? You probably, probably more, uh, more likely felt this uh, in terms of cool than, than heat, right? Every once in a while, you, you know, you're standing there comfortably, and then the wind blows, and it's, it's a cool breeze, right? And it's actually advecting or convecting cooler air towards you. Right? So that's that's advection, right? And the process of uh, diffusion and uh, well, let me ask you this: If I stand here with my torch and I light it, how far, how how Grace, how long does it take for you to feel the heat back there? Like you don't know? You were sleeping? You woke up? Okay. So, at least according to the mathematics. You feel it instantly. Do you believe that? If I light the torch, you feel it instantly. In fact, if you're sitting on Jupiter, you feel it instantly, according to the math. The problem is, you know, the perturbation in temperature is like 0 0.0000000001 joule, right? So it takes time for you to actually physically feel it in, the, in terms of a sensation, but mathematically, 
diffusion, that information travels infinitely fast. Infinitely fast. Versus convection, that information travels at finite speed. Right? It's the speed of the front. It's how fast I'm walking to you with the torch. That's how, that's, that's how uh, convection. So uh, in mathematical terms, diffusion equation is a parabolic equation. And the, the convection term is a hyperbolic equation. And the, the sort of ratio between uh, the coefficients determine which of those physics dominate. And so the example here is, you know, in, in reality, if I have a torch and I'm moving around in the room, there's a diffusion and advection going on, right? And so then the question becomes, if I light the torch and, you know, you're, you know, Grace again is back there in the back of the room, and I start to walk toward her. I'm convecting the torch toward her, like the heat. But if I walk this slow, <laughs> it's likely she's going to feel the heat from diffusion first, right? She's going to heat the whole room up. Everyone will feel the heat before I make it to her. In contrast, if I run the torch toward her, she's going to feel it due to convection first, and the diffusion is not as important. Okay, so whenever you have, oh, and then it turns out so the ratio of the coefficients determine the physics in terms of which, if you have a convective dominated flow or a diffusion dominated flow, and you've probably seen in a transport class or something. You remember the Peclet number? Remember the Peclet number? So Peclet number is a dimensionless quantity that quantifies sort of the rate of diffusion versus uh, advection. So if you have a Peclet number like greater than two, then you're in an advection-dominated flow. Your equations are more hyperbolic. And I'll draw a picture in a minute that sort of signifies what that means. But again, it means there's a front moving through the material that travels at some finite speed. So there's another physical equation that is also a hyperbolic equation. That's the wave equation. So the wave equation looks like this. So it's very similar to the diffusion equation, except and you have a second derivative in time here. So the wave equation governs, it's a hyperbolic equation, like a convective dominated flow, and it governs uh, basically, well, lots of things, but one thing it governs is the is uh, wave propagation in solids. Right? So I have my solid. Hold, hold the end of that. <laughs> so if I stretch it way out, my solid becomes fairly porous, and the wave travels at a velocity that I can, that we can see. So hold it real still. As soon as I told him to hold it still, he moved it. <laughs> okay, so let's see here. Keep moving. You guys see that? So that's the front moving in the material. That's that's an elastic wave. Right? And believe it or not, you know, that that's an elastic wave too. That's what you feel, right? Which is you can't see that one. All information travels via waves, right? So that's an elastic wave. That's also a hyperbolic equation. And so this is the idea, right? You can imagine, just like this elastic wave travels through the slinky and you can see it, there's a front moving through, there's a saturation front moving through the equations in an advective dominated flow. And it's got a sharp front, a discontinuity, a characteristic. If you remember, I don't know if I mentioned that, but you know the, the method we used to s solve the bucket ever problem was the method of characteristics. So it's got a characteristic uh, that travels through at some finite speed. And so, you know, what this sort of looks like uh, in our wave equation we, we, that we just saw is some some wave traveling through the body and. The, the thickness of this wave depends on how far I pluck it, you know, how far I pull it back, and that travels through the body. Now, in, the, in this example we had here, 
there's a free surface on the end, so what happens is the wave travels down, and I plucked it in tension, so it, it travels down in tension, and then it reflects in compression, and comes back to me, and then it reflects again. So what would happen is this thing moves down, this is like X here, So this thing moves this way, and it gets to the end, and it turns over and reflects in, in compression and goes back the other way. But the reason you have to upwind to sort of get to the point is our discretization has to be consistent with the physics. Right? So this is, this is the physics. The physics is that there's a sharp front of discontinuity propagating at finite speed through, through the material. And you know, so if we propagate this on in time, it continues to move like this. Well, if I wanted to compute the derivative of this thing, say right at the front, so if I wanted to compute the derivative of this thing right here, and I just used a finite difference scheme, like for example, if I just took a point here, a point here, and a point here, so you might call this i, i plus 1, i minus 1, and I use that to compute the derivative, right? Uh, a central difference approximation would ba basically, you know, I'd, I'd compute the function here, and the function here is zero. I'm going to draw a line through those guys, and that is the derivative, right? So that, using that approximation, u i plus one minus u i minus one over two delta x. Well, this is delta x. Well, that approximation is clearly a very poor approximation for the derivative. Right? That's telling me the derivative is like that when the derivative is, in fact, zero. Right? Zero. And so what we have to do is we, what, we, what we do when we upwind is we compute the derivative in a direction. We, we take points that are negative to the velocity. Right? So the velocity is that way then we would compute our approximation using these points. So we always compute the approximation this way, and we get a bit much better approximation. Now, in 1D, it's real easy, right? The velocity vector, it, I mean, 1D, the things are moving that way or they're moving that way. Right? Right? But in 2 and 3D, it can be more difficult to determine what, you know, what direction the velocity is moving and, and compute the, and come up with a, Come with a uh, upwinding scheme that works, because right, if, if if I have some two dimensional mesh grid, and you know, say then my front is moving through the material in this way. How do you suppose I would compute the velocity field of that front? You can use Darcy's law, right? We, assuming we have solved the equations for at least one time step, we know the pressure everywhere. If we know the pressure everywhere, we can then plug that into Darcy's law and get the velocity everywhere, right? The velocity field, okay, at all the grid points. So the velocity field would look something like the arrows I've drawn, right? But we need to upwind in directions opposite to that, right? So what do we do? Right? Because you know our, our finite difference is computed on the grid centers. Right? So we can we can do something. We can kind of come up with an approximation, but it's it's never perfect. And so anyway, we're not really going to talk about the more advanced schemes, but um, you know. So just one last thing to show you kind of effectively what we're doing or the kind of historical interpretation of what up, upwinding does. So if we go back to our generic equation, implement a winning scheme, and I'm only going to discretize spatial derivatives here. 
I'm going to upwind the convective term, so that's going to be pi i minus 1. You only have to upwind the convective terms. So I'm going to upwind the convective term. So if we rearrange this equation, So if we rearrange the equation, we get something that looks like this. And so remember, b was the coefficient multiplying the convective term. And now it's over here added to c you know, times delta x over 2 multiplying the diffusion term. Right? So it's like an extra diffusion term is what it appears. It, you know, apparently, this type of discretization results in an extra diffusion term. And so historically, uh, this was called numerical diffusion. But that's sort of unsatisfying because you're like, well, you know, I, I went through all this trouble to build my model, and I think my model's correct, and then I go to compute it numerically, and I'm having to add this artificial diffusion to make it stable. Because what happens is that with, if you don't do this at the saturation front, you get huge oscillations. Okay? Um, and so if you don't do the upwinding, you get these big oscillations. So you know, you say, well, I have to make it stable by adding this extra diffusion term, and that's sort of an unsatisfying solution. But it turns out, so this has been done, this upwinding's been done since the 50s, 60s, you know, when the first numerical reservoir simulators started coming online. Um, and then for the longest time, it was interpreted as numerical diffusion and everything else. But much, much later, uh, in the context of, of finite elements and the calculus of variations and other things, uh, this was able to be reinterpreted more accurately uh, through something called the variational multiscale method, and it sort of put to bed this this numerical diffusion I idea. Right? So we, we don't have time, or you know, that's really a graduate subject to get into the details of it. But just understand that while you often hear it called numerical diffusion, there as a, there actually is a physical basis or interpretation of this that says it is the correct thing to do, and correct with respect to the physics. It makes the you know the, the discretization is consistent with the physics of the problem. <coughs> 